Welcome to the You Can Heal Your Life podcast. I'm Helen Rochester, Editorial Director at Hay House UK. Today, I'm delighted to welcome my guest, Human Connection Specialist Simone Heng. Please join us as we discuss Simone's brand new book, Let's Talk About Loneliness, The Search for Connection in a Lonely World. Simone explores the topic of loneliness and disconnection. Drawing from her personal experiences and extensive research, she delves into the impact of technology on connection, the importance of authentic relationships, and provides insights on how to cultivate meaningful connections in a digital age. You can listen to the Let's Talk About Loneliness audiobook for free with a trial of the Empower You Unlimited audio app. To download the app today, visit hayhouse.com forward slash empower you. I hope you enjoy our conversation. So, Simone, um, for anyone who's not familiar with you, um, who are you and how did you come to write this book? Okay, so I um, am what is termed a human connection specialist. I guess it's just a very proper way of saying that I'm obsessed with this topic and with this area and I spend a lot of time speaking on it, reading on it, researching it, creating content online about it. And it came into my life for multiple reasons that all conspired at the same time. So my my mum was very ill and has a form of dementia where she couldn't connect with herself and with me. And then at the same time I was working in a really toxic workplace where there was a lot of lack of belonging and, and exclusion happening. And so everywhere I looked, this idea of loneliness and disconnection became just a topic that was a thread that went out went through my entire life and what why did you decide to write a book on it I think at first I thought what a way to really like stratify my thoughts about this topic because people have written about it before but I hadn't really read anything that made me feel less alone like there were textbooks on the science of connection but I wanted to put something in the world that really made the reader feel that loneliness comes in many forms it doesn't look like it used to look and I wanted people to feel when they read it like oh this girl's life some of it resembles what I've been through and I'm not alone I feel like people are embarrassed to be to admit that yeah. they're lonely I actually admitted it online the other day in a very vulnerable Instagram post and even though I talk about loneliness or not it, it, a lot, it was weird. It was only once they saw me like looking what they perceived to be what loneliness looks like, very raw, no makeup, sleepless, was then they were having a dialogue with me about it. But I, I was like, but I, you can be made up like this and be lonely. There's no um, shame in loneliness because it's actually just the, a body's biological response to being separated from what we perceive as our tribe so because we're wired as human beings for connection and we evolved in tribes what happened when we were cast out of that tribe is we would have this fight or flight response and that biological response is actually what loneliness is it's that's why it feels bad to us it's because it's saying you don't have safety numbers you're under threat go and find people before a saber-toothed tiger kills you or a foreign tribe comes and kills you. So that's actually what you're feeling. And on an incidental level, it's not bad at all. It's the body's alarm to go out and socialize. But it's when we characterize someone fully as lonely. They're, they're, it's not, I'm not feeling loneliness. I am lonely all the time that that's really, really dangerous. And I think people confuse the two, which is also why they're ashamed. They think if they say, I'm lonely right now, that means, oh, I'm this lonely person all the time. And we shouldn't be ashamed of either because they're, 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 it's wide into us to tell us to go and be back around people. I feel like there's a stereotype of the lonely person as well, that they're maybe older, that they're, they're you know, like, like your mum living in a care home, mm -hmm. that they're isolated. But actually, it seems like there are a lot more people who are younger who are actually feeling lonely. Yeah, I often think there's two um, stereotypes. One is exactly as you mentioned with my mum living in an aged care facility with no visitors. This is what we have, maybe my generation and Gen X, like late millennials and Gen X, we perceive that to be it. But now there is this new stereotype and it's come up in uh, the 2018 Signal Loneliness Index, which is a test where they survey people. And that Gen Z is actually the loneliest of all generations. 
and this is so to do surprising. with it. so surprising this is to do with um, a couple of factors some experts think it's to do with the fact there's such a ubiquity of technology in the way that they grew up so they don't know how to form um, bonds and at the same time they don't know what being fully connected feels like because they don't have the skills to start creating that immediately because they've been, they've been online so much. So the socialization maybe f that we would have experienced when we were thrown into like the discomfort of high school or the discomfort of primary school where you're finding your own identity against people. Imagine that you were in a pandemic during some of those years for two oh, and a half years. Gosh, it was like yeah. that really important developmental time. Yeah. Um, so you can see how that would contribute to being lonely when you don't know how to connect for what you need. Because it seems like some people have hundreds and you know even thousands of followers on social media, and yet when you say like, "Who are your friends?" That's, mm. it, that it's quite an uncomfortable question, isn't it? It is, and we know that we really can only maintain 150 meaningful connections. And this is in the book. It's by a um, very famous guy called I shouldn't say guy. He's a very respected <laughs> evolutionary <laughs> anthropologist called Robin Dunbar, and what he did the testing so that means our original hunter gatherer societies were about 150 people so if you have thousands of followers which i even do online i know because i'm older right that there's a very distinct difference between the people who are in that online community my online tribe and then my in-person intimate connections that i can go and cry to when i'm sad about my mum or i'm grieving about my dad you know that's yeah. A distinction that maybe if you are um, young right now like really young Gen Z maybe maybe you don't your brain doesn't have the maturity to have that distinction yet and that's really dangerous and that's where parents have to come in and hopefully this book will help share some light on that so they can help guide how the children are connecting. How can we tell the difference between authentic connections and the kind of, you know, the fake ones? Is that something that's really instinctive to us or do we have to learn? Oh, I think we learn that empirically through life. I think we learn that by when we're betrayed. I think yeah, we learn that yeah. by when we go through hardship and people aren't there for us, which is why I think in the book I do talk about some really hard things that have happened in my life. Um, and how I even distinguish that maybe some people who were family, because in my culture as an Asian woman, you're taught that you know family is life and family yeah. are authentic connection. But what I realized and was very difficult for me because of my conditioning was that um, just because they're an uncle or an aunt or a third cousin doesn't necessarily mean they are an authentic connection. I had to learn that through some trauma and some loss to find out what that actually means and that doesn't have to be someone you're blood related to. So authentic connection, we know we need five intimates, um, minimum five intimates. These are largely the people you might cohabitate with in your house. If you're single them, like me, you don't cohabitate, but these are the people you could go to in an existential crisis. Um, you could ask them for money if you needed. You could ask them to pick you up from the ho hospital if you had a surgery or something. Um, those are the people that we would consider intimate connections and authentic ones. You need those above all the other types of connection, actually. That's so true. I, uh, there's a, you know, you think about it, there's very few people you can call on. Yeah, it's not a big group. No. It's certainly not hundreds of thousands of people on the internet. And there's some sort of embarrassment in that as well. And, you yeah, know, asking a vulnerability. A vulnerability, yeah, yeah, that you have to kind of unpick. And so I would say, um, and I do talk about this a lot of, when, I, when I speak to audiences, is that, you know, vulnerability is the route to authentic connection. So we only take something from surface level, transactional relationships that you might have um, with maybe colleagues in the office, but you're not best buddies, right? Yeah. That only ever deepens and becomes a friendship based on some sort of disclosure of vulnerability. Yeah. That's very true. And I guess that's why we need to talk about loneliness. Because yes! the more you talk about it, the less of an issue that it becomes. But how, how can we go about making those connections what would you advise as a human connection specialist so I think firstly look at your existing connections and do an audit and actually this is good because this That's isn't hard. this isn't oh no this is in the book I was like but it's in the book in a very small uh, kind of exercise and that's really painful for a lot of people because by leaving, um, by not trimming the fat in terms of I went through this for years of who's in those um, existing connections, it's actually confusing you about what the good stuff feels like, what yeah. the real authentic connection feels like. And 
I guess because I've lived in a lot of countries um, as an expat over and over again, that culling process happens because once you leave a certain country, you realize who you still stay in touch with and who you don't. So it's happened organically. But recently, with now being based in Singapore, this is the longest I've been in a, um, a location. And I've had to actually actively do that. But it has by far been one of the best things I've ever done because it's by by really going, who are the five intimates? Who are those people that I'm going to invest? We're all very, very busy. And then, okay, who's the circle that goes out beyond that? And I think that can start to help address some loneliness because if you're around people in your intimate circle that you're investing energy and time into, that that gut feeling deep inside you knows yeah, that's they're so not, true, isn't it? in their presence, you will feel more lonely. And I, I, you, you feel you can't truly be yourself or trust. And so we did that Facebook Live recently on Hay House Facebook and there was a lady who wrote and it just absolutely broke my heart. I almost cried during the live. She said, I don't have those five people I can trust. I don't trust anyone. So that what that says to me is you can be surrounded by people and not feel and it feels hostile to you, which means you can still feel alone. Yeah, so well, that's really common as well. Really common. Particularly if you live in a city or you have a lot of social media followers or you're you know connecting to people digitally it's hard to know which are the the real connections that you can trust and I think also if you I was recently back in my hometown in Australia and I think if you I have grown up and lived in the same place so you never moved to the big city like London for example you know and you stayed yeah. in the village um you're it is much harder to audit people yeah and you've, there's a movie right now with Colin Farrell, The Ban- Banshees of oh, um, yeah. Inshirion, I think it's called. And it's all, I watched this and I was like, okay, it gets a bit dark at the end, but the beginning part of it is so similar to so much of the work that I talk about, how difficult that is to audit and say, I want quality connection in my life because that feeds me, nurtures me, we make each other better, we make each other feel more safe, and that's how we thrive as human beings versus the problem right now is because we have more access to people than we've ever had yeah. before in the history of mankind. <laughs> How that's such a it's a much harder job than living in a small village in Ireland like in in the movie although that that also seems very difficult because there's not many people to choose from but it's it's about going for that quality I think at the end of the day. And do you like mutually acknowledge with them that you know you're one of the special five or or is that something that remains unsaid that's sort of a feeling? I think it's a feeling and I think the five shifts and changes as you grow and I think most of the people in in this audience are seekers and they are people who grow and what you'll find over time is as you grow in consciousness the people you will be attracted to also grow in consciousness so for me the more on the learning journey I've been there's been more movement um, in my friendship circles than there's ever been before in my life when I wasn't a seeker and then I think it was a little bit more solidified so that's I think that's another subject about growth but so I don't think we need to say you're my five it's more like you're my five for for now for now yeah unless your five is your direct family so your husband and your child and then that makes sense that they are your um your five yeah you kind of stop you can't you can't really (laughs) exactly you um yeah yeah but then there are other kind of connections that you still need from outside of the five so do you think women make connections differently to men? Yes. In what way? So Susan Pinker, fantastic um, researcher in this field, she says that men go shallow and wide and women go narrow and deep. I think that's true. Yeah. So there's a, you know, there's a lot of what's emerging now in uh, like the authentic relating practice and in those circles are a lot of men's groups where people in the conscious living community, um, there are a lot of groups where men can go to be vulnerable with just men, um, which is the rise in popularity of that is showing me that there is a thirst within men to have those spaces, to feel more connected in a way that I think up until now um, was not being taught to them. No. And I think for anyone watching who has a husband or a boyfriend or a partner, um, is to allow your spouse to have that freedom, but also to be mindful that they 
they need that. Men, men and vulnerability don't often get associated with each other, no. but it's still a need to be able to have someone to disclose things to. I feel like the men in my life have fewer friends, but actually probably closer friends, whereas I feel like I've got you know hundreds of friends, but it's it's harder to identify which ones are the really close, authentic ones. And there seems to be more pressure on women as well to to make friends and to be expected to be friendly. Well, we see something called, I think it's called the uh, widower's effect, where, you know, women run the social, um, the social calendar for the household, and yeah, then when they totally. come to the end of the life, um, the, the husband will pass away very quickly after the wife passes away, because without her, the socialisation is lost. She runs yeah. the, the black book. And so, so there is pressure on women, and women do really run a lot of the the social agendas in a household from what the kids are doing and yeah. the whole ballet of um, what happens in, in the house. But men also, they do catch up with their buddies, but they the conversations that they have have are different. They're more surface level conversations. That's true. Yeah, and they're more um, informational based and less emotional disclosure. So they're more about like, did you see the football game? And did yeah. you, you know, or did you... Um, you know, did you see whatever on on television? You know, it's 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 more information based versus women are like I'm feeling this way at work, and there's that vulnerability, there's that matching in terms of the emotional disclosure. So men who really want to be vulnerable are now seeking out these men's groups where they can go and they can they can really say that because maybe their their football buddies that's totally they feel that's totally too weird to jump into yeah. their fo- the football buddies they've had for 25 years and be like, hey, I'm feeling really vulnerable today, can you let me talk? So there's now specific groups where men can go, which I think is wonderful. That is a really great thing. I know my husband, um, his best friend lost his father recently and they went out to the pub and came back and I was like, so have you, uh, how's his dad? You know, how are you feeling about the, the dad? And he was like, oh, we didn't even talk about that. And that's just so classic. Whereas, you know, yeah. I think women, even if they were at work, would go straight to the jugular, you know, they'd know yeah. exactly. Yeah, oh, how are you feeling? What can I do feeling? for you? Yeah. Like, uh, can I send you meals? What do you need? Yeah, so it's very, um, it's very different. And I think there's a whole separate book in that. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's the authenticity as well, isn't it, of the connection? But they're, they're, they're both valid in different ways, aren't they, those sorts of connections? Yeah, I, um, well, we need, there's a, there's a chapter two in the book is on the, the five different types of connection we need. So firstly, self-connection is the most important, and that's, you know, are you showing up for yourself? Do you have an awareness of your own experience? Um, and then we have micro connections and these are the ones which everyone until the pandemic completely underestimated. These are the seemingly banal everyday, um, interactions with the barista. Um, when you go to get your, yeah, you go get your sandwich (laughs) at Pret and you have a conversation, um, about I'm allergic to this and it's largely the conversations informational. Can you give me directions to go down here? Um, a nod to your neighbour, but it, it, they're, they're not deep conversations, but we still need them because they remind us we're part of um, a, a community. Yeah. And then after that, we have uh, intimate connection, which we talked about, which are your five. Relational connection, which are about 15 people, according to Robin Dunbar. And this is where you feel you're part of a community that you could call on like for a favour, like, oh, um, would you be able to come and like dog sit my dog? So you're... Some people are so lonely they don't feel that they even have that. So they might live in an apartment block, but they don't really know their neighbours, don't really feel that they could, in an emergency, ask for anything. Yeah. So we need we need that. And the third, um, the next type is collective connection. And this is where you don't have to be best buddies, but you're part of a tribe. And this is something that I saw at Hay House Writers' Workshop in Edinburgh, right? So all of these women are bonded by their love of Louise Hay, and the love of the Hay House brand and what it's about. They don't have to be best buddies, they don't need to ever have been met before, but there is an understanding that they have a commonality. And this should not be underestimated because if you don't have collective connection and you feel misunderstood within your own family, within your own intimates, for example, this can lead people to join gangs, this can lead people to join extremist groups because there they feel understood. So you still need that. So whether it's your church group, quilting group, temple group, Wherever you need, you still need cycling buddies. Don't have to be telling them your whole life story, 
but you have a, a hobby or a commonality that binds you. So that's what a lot of men, what we talk like, yeah. yeah, like the bowling group, the whatever group they're part of, yeah. that still is giving them a very important sort of connection. And those connections were so lost during the pandemic, weren't they? Yes. We couldn't go do our hobbies or see those friends. And actually, we just kind of, everything contracted, didn't it? I mean, you were lucky if you had your five intimates. Yes, absolutely. So, you know, we we need multiple sorts of connection. I think one of the biggest things that I get scared about when I look online at a lot of the Instagram accounts where there's no research behind it is telling people someone's not there for you cut them off or if your husband's not oh, giving you all yeah. of these things he's a bad husband and it's like well go no, non-contact yeah non-contact <laughs> vote them off the island um, and we've never been lonelier than we are before and so yes I think if a relationship is abusive toxic bullying yes cut the person loose have boundaries right but Let's not um, let's not do what the lonely brain actually wants us to do, which is hold people we love or or our connections to a higher standard than is reasonable. So that's how the cycle happens. So when I see a lot of these tiles, I think, did lonely people make these tiles? Because it's it's what a lonely brain would tell you to do. So yeah. we just we just have to be so mindful about connection. It is so value. It's the secret to us thriving as a species do you know that that's how big that's how big human connection is I think that came out in the pandemic I thought it was so interesting you know the first week we all towed the line the second week we didn't tow the line so much I mean my neighbors we we found a way we sat in the garden we were we had like at least 20 feet between us but we were sitting there and you know over the fence talking it just seemed like it was a human need to talk to people it is absolutely a human need and I talk about this in the book like what has led to homo sapiens being dominant whether that's good or bad of all the species is our um, our ability to work and thrive in numbers and we've been able to do extraordinary things now we can see with AI and robotics where everything is going and if we lose that and we have huge issues for our own immunity because it affects our immunity our well-being both mental and physical is affected so this is uh it's not as big as what's happening the environment but this is uh, quite an intersection of of time for us in, in terms of when the metaverse becomes ubiquitous this could really go the other way we could become even more isolated so we need to prioritize this now which is why totally this book that. is important, yeah. I went to a children's party at the weekend and they had that, um, you know, the, the, the VR headset. Yes! And one child could use it at a time. And there was nothing more sad than they had, like, these computers set up for gaming and all the kids were playing together. And then the one lonely child was there with this VR headset on, just completely alone. It was, it was definitely a big illustration of how things could go. Yeah. And the happiness was where the kids were all together, playing together. And the sadness was where this person was on their own. But, Sorry, but bring in, us down. <laughs> no, no. But in their mind, in that child's mind, what's happening the VI headset they think is awesome. So that's yeah, the difference. They were queuing for it. <laughs> yeah, they were queuing for it. That's um, maybe that's our generation that sees that connection is important because we had an analog childhood. But I bought one of the VI headsets and I write about in the book. Part of me feels like for people like my mum who are um, paralyzed. How incredible. They can travel. You can literally travel in there. How amazing, right? And then on the other side of it, I ended up being there for like three hours until the battery ran out. And oh I realized the, addic- the addic- addictive nature of this, um, we have to be so mindful how we use this technology. Yeah, it's a big responsibility, yeah. isn't it? And the effects on our brains and our personality are just, we, we're only yeah. just seeing and, the results now, aren't we, really? And kids learning to interact with avatars. Yeah. So even how a child learns to read emotion is from their primary caregiver. So imagine how socially awkward if the child learns to emote um, and mirror from playing with their avatar friends in, 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 in their own headsets together, in, in their own homes, in their own rooms. But it feels like human nature will always will out. I mean, it was like in the pandemic, the children seemed to find ways of connecting with, with each other in the way that adults didn't because we were all kind of like 
back and the ki- the kids just found and sought each other out even when you walk down the street you could see them wanting that connection yeah i think it feels that's like a amazing. human need doesn't it? it it is a basic human need so love connection belonging what i lo- i've loved seeing is how people have so quickly boomeranged back into socialization like it's just yeah we were socially awkward for about 90 days after the pandemic and now everyone's again back on it. yeah and that um that's amazing and so in conclusion if we start talking about loneliness what's what are the benefits to us what are the benefits to us of loneliness or of, of talking about of it of talking about it um i think firstly we have to destigmatize it like there's nothing wrong with saying you have felt loneliness or you are lonely every one of us on the planet even the introverts who rave this is not a problem for me. There's a lot of this on TikTok. It's quite funny. It's like, I don't need human connection. I just need Wi-Fi connection. You know, there's a <laughs> lot of this. Um, everyone needs connection on a different level of the spectrum. So the benefits of talking about it, it's a universal topic. So just because you might be an introvert and you don't need much connection, that doesn't mean there isn't someone in your network that needs it. Or you could become a parent to a child who's an extrovert, highly social, who needs that and might become lonely. So... In effect, by talking about it, we actually equip each other with serving other people in our tribe. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So even by talking about it, we are aiding connection. Um, So that's the big. That's the biggest benefit. I would love for it to just be the same way we talk about diabetes or um, the dangers of smoking, the dangers of being sedentary at your desk working. The same. Um, and I think we're getting closer there. You know, the UK has a minister for loneliness. I believe Japan does too, but don't quote me on that. The governments around the world know that we're in a loneliness epidemic. So it, it takes someone that's a little bit more what I a little bit more mainstream like me, hopefully, to be the messenger that goes, look, we all need to be uh, speaking about this. And that for me is the biggest benefit because we are going to prevent suicides. Yeah. We're going to prevent things, um, many of the mental disorders, like my mum, my mum is a hoarder, has, sorry, has hoarding disorder. So that is also um, a symptom of loneliness. And so a lot of the precursors for a lot of mental health issues is actually loneliness. Um, And so we're going to help people extend their lifespans too, because loneliness causes shortened lifespan. Raising raising, um, that fight or flight response in the body means Stress hormones are channeling through the body all the time, which then damages your immunity. So people who are chronically lonely have a shorter life expectancy than socially well-connected people. It's more dangerous than smoking, alcohol use habit, or obesity. So it's so... That's sobering, isn't it? So, yeah, so this is the benefit of talking about it, is we're literally extending lives. Incredible. And when's your book coming out? June 27th. And are there any... What a wonderful, uplifting summary <laughs> to talk about loneliness. <laughs> Just bring that on the beach and, you know, um, <laughs> I won't judge you. Um, so, yeah, yeah. And uh, are you offering any um, incentives to buy your book? Any bonuses that we should know about? Yes, of course. <laughs> um, so the book, if you purchase it, um, we're going to have a, a, a website, um, let's talk about loneliness.com. And on the website, when you put your purchase number in, you'll also get uh, an annual membership to my um, presentation skills school if you like it's like a community there's 27 hours in there so if you liked how i showed up today it's going to teach you how to do that and and if you have your own message you're interested in spreading to the world that will help and then there is also a special ebook that we've created on navigating difficult conversations because if you want to retain and enrich existing connections somewhere along the line you're going to have a difficult conversation with someone that's been in your life for a long time your intimates especially, your your spouse, your parent. And so it teaches you the tools of how to navigate that really well. Fantastic. Thank you so much. It's been brilliant talking to you. Thank you, Helen. <laughs>